Okay. Like we said before, the North Carolina statute of frauds does require any contract for the sale of real estate to be in writing, right? So this must be in writing. Can we have an oral deal to sell real estate? Oh, see, that's such a trap question. Can we have an oral deal to sell real estate? Yes. 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 But what is not true of an oral deal to sell real estate? It is not enforceable in a court of law. Of course we can have an oral deal. Remember, folks, I told you if somebody shows up with money and somebody else shows up with the deed, what are we going to do? We're going to close. The key here and why contracts are important is if people don't show up to close. Right? That's the only time this document matters. You can fill these things out for the rest of your career. And I hope, for your sake, that you, that you have wasted every ounce of that time you spend filling these things out. I have been in this business for well over a decade, and I have wasted every second I ever spent filling one of these out. You know why? Because I've never had a single one end up in a court of law. Thank God. <laughs> right? And that's the only place this thing, like any other contract, matters, right? Don't fall into that trap of that kind of a question. Yes, of course we can have an oral deal for real estate in North Carolina, but it's not going to be enforceable. That's the key. We can have any kind of deal we want to. We can have illegal deals. We can have all kinds of things. The key there is they're not enforceable in a court of law. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I know I trapped you on that one. I know it's early. It's Monday night. I get it. So, but it is, that's the, that's the key to understanding contract law, right? It's not can we do it. Of course we can. We can do anything we want to do. The key is would a court agree with us? And if it's not in writing, court would not. Okay? All right? So we've already talked about offerors and offerees. By the way, don't y'all love all the stuff that you got coming in? You sure that you see on the board today about effective age? And, doesn't it look fun? That is more fun to me than that. Yeah, I agree. I oh, much, this is much more fun. I'd this much is, rather do that. This, this is, is like, I'm not... <clears throat> this is paint dry stuff. I know. Yeah. It, it is. Like, it's like... I feel like I was a lawyer last week. And yeah. now I'm kind of starting to feel like I'm an appraiser. Well, in all honesty, <laughs> in all honesty, most closing attorneys will tell you that this class is at least a semester worth of law school. At least. Most attorneys will tell you that. So, so I can go to law school. I, I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> 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 the way you're saying it is I can make it out. I mean, <laughs> like, like most things with school nowadays, as long as you're willing to pay tuition somewhere, yes, you probably can go to law school. Um, I mean, there's somewhere that will take you as long as you have a bachelor's degree. Somewhere. And I'm not commenting on you. I'm just the general state of things is, you know, we could all get into the American Samoa School of Law tomorrow, I'm sure, as long as we're going to pay <laughs> tuition. The LSAT. So, I don't know if you do have to take the LSAT to get into some of those Seriously? law schools. I think they have really have money. lean, yeah, they, that, is, that is pretty we much the one prerequisite, is having money. And an undergraduate degree, which they will also help you with if you don't already have one and you have money. So, it's uh, very lenient. Um, so, the offeror is the person making the offer, right? The offeree is the person receiving the offer. What happens if we have a counteroffer? It's rejected. Those roles change. They reverse. They flip, right? Yes. Counteroffer flips those roles. What does counteroffer also do? Rejects it. It rejects it. It terminates the original offer, correct? Yes. So, Leslie, two chapters ago, you asked me a question. I have waited this long to answer it. She said, you skipped over that whole meeting of the minds thing. Remember that night when you said that? She's like, what about this meeting of the minds? You didn't talk about that. I said, I'm going to get there. Okay? I knew I was coming to tonight at some point. This communication of acceptance, that really is the meeting of the minds. And meeting of the minds just means we need to show that these two parties have truly agreed on these terms, okay? 
And that moment is what we call communication of acceptance. And we're going to talk about communication of acceptance in detail. If you are the least bit shaky when you leave here tonight about when a contract is formed, please go back and watch this video over and over again. If there's one single thing in this class where I can guarantee you you're going to see multiple test questions about a single little point, it is when is a contract formed. Knowing that exact instance when we go from we got an offer in play to where we got a contract in place. Can I help you, ma'am? No. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so the last bullet point down here is an important one, and I'm going to kind of venture off into real estate commission rules for just a second. That last bullet point says earnest money deposits are returned in full if no contract is formed. Now, what did I tell you all about earnest money last week, about trust monies last week? What did I say about those that money that goes into a trust account? It belongs to both parties, Megan said, right? And Isaiah, what, what, what were you adding there? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, I was going to say it has to be disclosed to the police when it's dispersed to whatever it is. We got to have both parties agree to have it dispersed, right? Because it belongs to both of them. I said, no matter what the contract says, what do we need? Agreement from both parties, right? To release it. Doesn't that seem different than what I'm saying right here? Earnest money gets refunded in full. There's no contract is formed. That last part is the key. If no contract is formed, folks, did the earnest money ever belong to the seller at all? No. Whose money is it 100% if we don't ever form a contract? The buyer's money. So if the buyer asks for it back, what do you do with it? You give it back to them. Anytime before what happens? Before a contract is formed. You just learned a big real estate commission rule right there. You learned something that brokers have been in this business 30 years don't know right there. I promise they don't. They don't have any idea what to do and when they can give it back and when they can't give it back. Yes, sir, can. This, <coughs> so this contract is <coughs> formed. <coughs> Before or <clears throat> after the level of intent, right? Or, or no intent. letter of intent. No letter of intent. Just I want to buy your house. Okay, send me the contract. Send me the contract, and then the money is. Just what, what's the first word on that? Valuable consideration. Mm -hmm. Offer. At the very top, the title. Offer. Offer. So, what do you do when you want to make an offer? When you tell somebody, "I want to buy your house," what do you do? Send that. You send this form. When it's got one set of signatures on it, what is it? An offer. When it's got two sets of signatures on it and it's been communicated, what is it? Contract. A contract. We use the same document. Same document. So we want to make an offer? You be filling out all 12 pages of this bad boy. Goodness. This is the, I always picture one with a sheet. You know, <laughs> yeah. you write I liked your vision better. Sign at the bottom. Uh -uh. No. Goodness. No, wait till you write wait till you write up about six of these that don't get accepted for somebody. It ain't no fun, I promise. Promise. Like, all, you do is all right, so back to this whole earnest money thing. Important rule. Important, super important. If we have a contract, who does the money belong to? Both parties. If we don't have a contract, who does it belong to? The buyer. If, we, if it belongs only to the buyer and they ask for it back, what do you do? You give it back to them. Because it's not yet an earnest money deposit. Does that make sense? It doesn't become an earnest money deposit until it is what? Contract. Under contract. <clears throat> Once it's under contract, then and only then, thank you very much, is it an earnest money deposit. Okay, so does that bullet point make sense now? That if no contract is formed, we return the money in full to that buyer. Okay. Matter of fact, and this is where I go even a little bit further in the real estate commission rules, we don't even have to, how many of you have looked at the real estate commission rules, by the way? How many of you have looked at it? I told you, you had to, your assignment was to read it at least. No, no, I didn't do it. I know you didn't. They don't listen. Right? 
the inherent problem of real estate class. Never listen to me. I'm sorry. In the back. Yes. In the I've, back. I've read one page. You read <laughs> one page. That's better than your compatriots in the rest of the room. I know. I read one page. At least they were honest. They knew better than to lie because they knew I was going to pin them down on something, right? I was waiting for a hand to shoot up and I was going to fire a question at them. I know you didn't read it. So I start telling you five weeks early. If I tell you to read it once a week for five weeks, you might read it one time. That's the general rule of thumb, right? It is important to read it, okay? Here's what the, here's what the Real Estate Commission actually says about trust monies. They say you have three banking days to get them deposited. Three banking days, not calendar days, but banking days to get them deposited. From the time it touches the firm's hands. When does it touch the firm's hands? When it's accepted by who? The office accepts it? <clears throat> no. Who would accept this money? Buyer's agent. It could be a buyer's agent. Or the seller's agent. Could be a seller's agent. <laughs> when it's accepted by the entity that's going to hold it. Is there only a lawyer? Well, if it's a lawyer, they're not subject to real estate commission rules. Okay? So, but, so in this case, we have to assume it's some real estate firm that's holding this thing, right? Three banking days from the time it hits their hand. So does that mean, <coughs> let's say I'm a listing firm. And by the way, it is most common for the listing firm to hold the earnest money deposit. That is the most common thing. Listing firms in most situations, it's becoming less common, but it's still the most common thing for the listing firm to hold the earnest money deposit. So does that mean I'm the listing agent, I get the earnest money deposit check, two banking days later I give it to my broker in charge, do they have three banking days to deposit it? No, no. no because when it touched my hands, did it not touch the firm's hands? No. And that clock begins to tick three days from the time I received it, but it's not that simple. It would be great if our lives were that simple and the rule was that simple it was just straight up three banking days. Three banking days from whichever one of these two things occurs later. When we get the money or when we go under contract. Three banking days from the later of those two things. Either when we get the money or we go under contract. What if somebody hands us the earnest money check with an offer? Has our clock started to tick yet? No. It's not an earnest money deposit yet, is it? So, has our three days started to go off the clock yet? No. no. That will blow your mind. Does that mean you don't deposit it? No. It means it's up to you. Completely up to you. The Real Estate Commission doesn't have anything to do with it at that point. What they say is, the Real Estate Commission doesn't say when it's the best time to do something. Their rules, if you think about them, are always when it's the what? Worst. Not worst, but <laughs> last. You must do this by this time, right? You must present the work with real estate agents no later than when? First substantial. substantial contact. Do they say you can't do it sooner? No. You must put a buyer agency agreement in writing no later than when? Not when you're under contract, when you what? When you make an offer. Do they say, do they say you can't do it sooner? No. You must put Fire at dual agency into writing no later than when? Before you present an offer. Do they say you can't do it sooner? No. Real Estate Commission never says, oh, you should do it as soon as possible. They say you must do it no later than this. And the rule about depositing trust monies is the same thing, folks. It is you must do it no later than three banking days from either the time you received it or when we went under contract, whichever happened later. So is it okay, and I realize I'm going on a big detour here, but it's an important detour because you're going to see test questions about it and you got to know it for the real world. Is it okay if for you to be a buyer's agent, your buyer write up an offer on this contract, on this document, 
and you're negotiating that deal and for you to have the earnest money deposit check paper clips to this thing for a week. Is that okay? You negotiate. You're still negotiating. It's not? Okay. You can do it, but it's Absolutely. Not okay. Sure it's okay. Sure, it's fine. The clock hasn't started. The clock hasn't started. According to real estate commission rule, is that fine? Yes. Because the clock doesn't start ticking until what? Until we're under contract. Now I'm going to ask you the question the other way around. We've, we've gone under contract. I don't have the check yet. Has my clock started ticking? No. You can't have a clock ticking on something you don't have in your hands, right? So you always get at least three banking days to deposit the thing. If we're already under contract and then they give me the check, when does the clock start to tick? The instant I get the check, right? Does that make sense? If they give me the check and we're not under contract, when does the clock start to tick? Whenever we go under contract. Because that's the moment it becomes trust money. That's the moment it belongs to both of them. Does that make sense? Now, I'm going to ask you a hard question. We are under contract. I have the earnest money deposit check in my possession. My firm is going to be the escrow agent. It says on the contract that United Real Estate Raleigh will be holding the earnest money deposit. And we have it. We just went under contract this morning. I have not been to the bank. I have not deposited it. The buyer calls me and says, I want my earnest money back. What do I do as the broker in charge? They have to, they have to yeah. come on an agreement because it's there already on the front side, right? I can, both of you are right. I can't refund it unless who agrees? The seller. The seller. Because does it matter that I've got it in my account yet or not? Okay. Who does that money belong to? Both, both parties. Do you understand why I can't release it at that point? Does that make sense? I understand I spent a long time on that. But see, right there, you understand the trust account rule. You understand why it's designed the way it's designed. Now, if the buyer had called me and said, I want it back before we went under contract, what would I do with it? I'd give it back to them. Does it make any difference if it's been deposited or not been deposited? No. No. If the buyer had given me the check a week ago and I decided, look, I don't want this thing paper clipped to my contract, can I deposit it? Even if we don't have a contract, can I deposit it? Sure, if somebody gives you a check, you're free to deposit it. Absolutely. Now, buyer tells me they want their money back. If we're not under contract, do I give it back even if I've deposited it in the trust account? Yeah. Do I need the seller's permission to give it back to them? No. no. It's their money. But the moment we go under contract, it becomes equally buyer money, seller money. Does that make sense? And that is no matter what this thing says about that earnest money deposit. Because that's going to be the biggest source of confusion for you on this rule. When we get into this thing later tonight, there's going to... I want you... I'm fine. I'm going to call it to attention right now. i got to find where the heck it is, but I'm going to call it to your attention. Oh, God, I used to know what paragraph it was. Oh, I used to know that they shuffled everything around this year and put things in different orders. Um, uh, page 2 E. e. Page 2, paragraph E. The initial earnest money deposit, the additional earnest money deposit, and any other earnest money paid in connection with this transaction, here and after collectively referred to as earnest money deposit, shall be deposited and held in escrow by escrow agent until closing, at which time it will be credited to the buyer or until this contract is otherwise terminated. In the event this offer is not accepted or a condition resulting the contract is not satisfied, the earnest money deposit shall be refunded to the buyer. 
In the event of breach of this contract by the seller, the earnest money deposit shall be refunded to the buyer upon buyer's request. But such return shall not affect any other remedies available. Blah, 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 blah. In the event of the breach of this contract by the buyer, the earnest money deposit shall be paid to the seller as liquidated damages. There's that word. What does that mean? Liquidated damages. What does that mean? You don't have to take them to court. Not only do I not have to take them to a court, I cannot take them to court because we have agreed in advance this is what I will get if they breach, right? Isn't mm -hmm. that what liquidated damages means? Mm -hmm. So we got a whole paragraph here that says exactly in the, in the event of this, this is what happens to this earnest money. In the event of this, this is what happens to this earnest money. How much attention do you pay to this if you are the escrow agent? Zero. Because it ain't there for us. Where does this thing matter? In court. Who's all that language there for? Judges and lawyers. What do we do with earnest money deposits? And hold them until what happens? Closing. We don't care about breaches. Closing. Or they both agree to give it back. That's it. Or they both agree to whatever we're going to do with it, right? The only two things, or three things, I'm going to add a third wrinkle in there. The only three things we care about when it comes to holding trust money is closing. We're free to disperse it then, right? Both parties agree what we're going to do with it. I don't care if somebody breached. That's not my job to figure out if they breached, right? What I need is some document that gives me permission from both parties to disperse this money. And number three, what do you think the third possible result is? Where does this thing matter? What's all that language for? Court. court. So what's the third possible way? A court order. A court order that tells me what to do with this money. If I'm holding an earnest money deposit, folks, I'm waiting for one of those three things to happen. That's my job. Wait for closing. Wait for them to give me an agreement that says this is what we want you to do with the money. Or wait for a court to tell me what to do with that money. It's not my job to figure out if they've breached. I'm not that good. Does that make sense? So I tell you that before we get into the line by line of this contract. I want you to understand what's likely to happen to the earnest money. But I also want you to understand you're not the one to enforce that. Who is? Court of law. Court of law. We need an agreement. Okay? That was a long time to on one slide. Okay? Does everybody understand that now? We're good. We're good on that portion of holding trust money. Okay. Three banking days, right? Three banking days, which is Monday through Friday. For state law, federal law, Saturday counts as banking day. You don't need to know that. You need to know that in real world when it comes to disclosure and all that stuff, but not now. Banking day is Monday through Friday. Communication of acceptance. This is the magic time when we go from offer to contract. Not acceptance itself. What is acceptance? What does acceptance look like? Somebody doing what? Alright, so how does somebody show their agreement? Sign by. I sign. Acceptance is signing. Are we under contract when they sign? Yes. 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 That's and, why every single one of you need to go back and watch this video over and over. <laughs> And over again. Well, when you get sign it, give it signing time. has nothing to do with us being under contract. What did I say was the magic time? Communication. Communication. What's, what word comes first? Communication. What word is most important? Communication. Communication. The acceptance, folks, the signing is useless without the communication of that acceptance. You can take that signed document around the world with you if you want to, and it is useless unless you have communicated that it is signed. Does everybody follow me on that? So, when you get test questions about this, and you will get test questions about this, 
you're going to get long paragraphs, two, three, four paragraphs, about this offer that has been bounced back and forth. And they're going, to, they're going to bring in buyer's agents, and they're going to bring in listing agents, and they're going to bring in dual agents, and they're going to bring in sub-agents of the seller. And this thing's going to get bounced from person to person to person to person. And they're going to want to know, when was a valid contract formed? What are you always looking for? When is a contract formed? When it's communicated. Communication of acceptance. So let's talk about what that is. We've got a buyer on one side of a transaction, and who's on the other side of the transaction? The seller. The seller. Complicated, right? Communication of acceptance, folks, has to cross from one side of that board to the other. It doesn't matter if it goes from buyer to seller or seller to buyer. It can work both ways. Who's going to be communicating the acceptance? The first one to sign the thing or the last one to sign the thing? The last one. The last one. The last one who signs, which is always the offer E, right? That could be the buyer, could be the seller. But the last one to sign is the one who's got to communicate the acceptance. Does that make sense? And they have to communicate it to the other side of the transaction. So when you get these questions, I want you to make two charts on your page. When you get to the state exam, you're doing it on a computer, I want you to write it down on a sheet of scrap paper. I want you to write buyer. And I want you to write seller. And as you read through this thing, you're going to put these people that they give you, the names, the names of the firms, the names of the real estate agents, the name of the buyer, the name of the seller, you're going to put them on the side of the page they go on. Because you're going to have to draw lines. You're going to need to draw lines from one person to another, one firm to another. And you need to see at some point a line going this way, and what else? A line going the other way. When you see that, you're under contract. At that moment, when you have lines going in both directions, one side of the page to the other, you're under contract. Okay? So let me, I'm going to just give you one verbally. I'm going to talk it out. And you're going to tell me if we have a contract. Carlos is a buyer agent affiliated with United Real Estate Rob. What do I know so far? Where's Carlos? Where's United Real Estate Rob? Right now. He's working with Quinn on her purchase of a property in Raleigh. Quinn. 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 Oh, Quinn. Q-U-I-N-H, right? Let me make sure I get that right. He's working with Quinn, who's purchasing a property in Raleigh. She's a buyer, right? Mm -hmm. They look at a home listed by Jeff of ABC Realty at 123 Main Street in Garner. Where's Jeff go? So, so. What else? ABC Realty. Carlos helps Quinn fill out a properly formatted 2-T, offer to purchase and contract provided by the North Carolina Association of Realtors and the North Carolina Bar Association. See how that's going to scare you to death, right? It's not going to scare you. It's just that thing. Right? The offer is presented via facsimile to Jeff of ABC Realty. What am I going to do right now? Do you agree with that arrow? Mm -hmm. Carlos has presented the offer to Jeff. Mm -hmm. Jeff emails the offer to his client 
Susie Seller. Yeah. Put Susie's name over here on the seller side, right? Jeff emails to Susie. Susie signs the, signs the offer without any changes, and she returns in person the now accepted document to the offices of ABC Realty. Right? Mm -hmm. Are we under contract? No. no. Why not? Because See how easy that is? Mm -hmm. You know why it's easy? Because you're looking at it. Because you're looking at it. That's why it's easy. I'm already two paragraphs into something. If you weren't looking at it, lost. Completely in the woods, no hope of recovery, lost. Already. Because of all the words, right? But if you draw it out, it's pretty simple. Do I have an arrow going from seller side to buyer side? No. ABC Realty broker in charge places the offer in Jeff's mailbox. Jeff, in turn, emails the offer back to Carlos. Do we have a contract? Yes. yes. When? After after the the when Jeff emailed, emailed it back to Carlos. That moment, right there, is when we're under contract. Does Quinn, the buyer, have any idea she's under contract? No. Has she seen the document? No. No. Better yet, has Carlos even seen the document? No. No. Are we under contract? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. One hundred percent. Absolutely, we're under contract because we have had that communication of acceptance. That chain has jumped from one side of the page to the other. Does that make sense? So when you get one of these questions, are you going to write these charts down yeah. and draw all these goofy little arrows? Okay. And here's the thing. As you read, if I had said, you know, Carlos presents this offer and Susie makes one small change and then sends it back to ABC Realty, what am I going to do? Yeah. That line goes away. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Because that offer is coming back. Never existed in the first place, right? Wasn't that our first offer from Carlos over to Jim? Mm -hmm. And if we make one change, that first offer is where? Terminated. Terminated. Gone. So now that we have a contract, same chain of events. She made one change, she signed the thing, she sent it back to ABC, and the broker in charge of ABC sent it to Jeff. Jeff emailed about the college. Do we have a contract? No. No, because we're missing that communication of service. Now we have to have. Carlos communicates the changes to Quinn. Quinn calls Jeff directly, tells him she accepts. Do we have a contract? Yeah. Yes. Does it matter who on either side we communicate to? No. It doesn't. We can have any party on either side communicate with any other party on the other side. To have this communication of acceptance. Okay? Uh, so anyone on the seller side could even contact the firm and say, yes, we agree, such such purchase offer, send on such such day, can you let whoever know? Anybody on the seller side can contact anybody on the buyer side, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So you contact the firm. Yes, absolutely. Because who represents this buyer? Uh, the firm. The whole firm, right? And every buyer, every broker in that firm. What if they're in the dual agency? Now, that's a good question. Her question is, what if they are in designated dual agency? Now, first of all, if we were in designated dual agency, would we have two firm names on the board there? No. No, no we would have URE on both sides, right? Right. But what if Jeff decided to call the firm and let the message that the firm designated so much? Can he do that? If we're in designated dual agency, can he do that? No. I mean, Susie. But Doesn't matter, because Jeff's the broker, right? Yeah. Can Susie do that if she's in designated dual agency? 
Tell me how many brokers represent Susie if she's in designated dual agency. One, and only one. So who would she have to speak with if she was in designated dual agency? Yeah. Jeff and Jeff directly. Mm -hmm. Which is one of the reasons we have to tell them not only that now we're in this designated dual agency thing, you know, that thing you agreed to before, we've gone into it now because now it's a buyer who's represented by our firm interested in your property. So you can only talk to me from now on. But also we got to tell them what? Who not to talk to. Which in that case would be Carlos, right? The agent who's been designated to represent so, so the buyer. So she couldn't call Carlos directly in, that, directly in that scenario either? Sure she could but to communicate you? acceptance. She can't call and expect representation, right. but she could always call him to communicate acceptance. Could she call another broker in the firm, though, That's not associated with the transaction? That was her question, and she could not. But what if she did? If she did, they should tell her, I'm not involved in this transaction. There's no communication. That's right. right. We don't have communication of acceptance. All right. Wow. Because in designated dual agency, how many brokers represent that seller? One. How many brokers represent the buyer? One. One. So those are the only two points of contact other than the buyer and seller themselves at that point. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is everybody good on this contract formation thing? Okay. And we're gonna, I'm going to give you a couple of rules here, but in general, is everybody understanding of the basics of this communication of excess? Did I lose anybody? Good. So up here on the on the screen, you've got something called, it says, first of all, communication and acceptance can be by any acceptable method. Well, what are acceptable methods? Pretty much any method of communication. If you can think of it, you can communicate with it, it's an acceptable method of communication. The Real Estate Commission doesn't eliminate anything. In fact, they even list telegraph still as an effective method of communication. Most of you have no idea what a telegraph is, I am sure. Um, I don't even know if they still exist anywhere. Can you send telegraph? Will, will Western Union do a telegraph? I'm looking at forward. I've got such age discrimination, <laughs> by the way. You know that? <laughs> well, I mean, I know Western Union exists to send money, but will they still send a telegraph? I have no idea. Most of you didn't know that's what Western Union used to do. Um, but uh, tele telegraphs, for those of you all who are under the age of, say, 35, were just, they were words. Instead of a phone call, somebody brought you a message to your door. It's like somebody sent you an email, but they sent it to somebody else and they had to hand deliver it to you. That was a telegram. Um, and um, even that is still an acceptable method of communication. Faxes are acceptable. How about email? Yes. yes. Telephone? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Text? Yeah. Yes and no. I get it. Yes, they are. They're fine. Here's the problem with text, and here's why I don't like it, and why I don't just blanket say yes. Have you ever sent a text to somebody who doesn't have text messaging on their phone? Again, you people over 35. I know nobody under 35 could imagine such a thing. There are still people out there. They're fewer and further between, but there are still people out there who do not have text messaging plans on their phone. If you send them a text, what happens? It comes back. Does not come back. You think it just disappears into the nether region somewhere, right? You get all mad at them. You're pissed off because you sent them 42 messages and you, you never respond to my text. And they're like, well, I don't have text messaging, right? Meanwhile, you've been texting them for a week. That's the problem with text messaging. Now, if you've been texting back and forth with the other side already, you know, you've already established that as a line of communication, no problem with communicating acceptance that way. In my opinion, email is the best way to communicate acceptance. Number one, it's instant, just like text messaging. Number two, has a much better paper trail than does text messaging. Right? It's, it's harder to fake emails. It's easier to track emails and when they were sent. Text messages, you can have a phone record and it shows you sent a message, but it doesn't show what the message was. You know, you have to take like a picture of your phone or it's just a pain to try to document. Email is very easy to document. So in my opinion, email is probably the best form of communication. How about dropping it in the mailbox? Can you communicate that way? Yes. Yeah. Not only can you, there's a special rule about that. And you all know it for test-taking purposes. 
This is a very old rule called the mailbox rule. The idea here is simple. Once you communicate acceptance, you can't take it back. That's what the idea behind the mailbox rule is. Once you communicate acceptance, you can't take it back. And it doesn't matter if that communication has made it to the other side or not. You can't take it back. So here's what we mean by that. When you drop a signed contract in the mail to somebody, could you maybe, is it possible somebody might change their mind before that signed contract actually gets to its destination? I drop it in the mailbox this morning. I have second thoughts today at lunch. And I call them up and say, look, just ignore that thing when it shows up today. I'm not going to buy your house. Is it possible that somebody would have those kind of second thoughts? Yeah, it's possible. Is it possible for them to call and say, ignore that thing when it shows up in the mail? You can't do it, but it's possible. They may call, but can they? No. Can they with? No. no. Because the mailbox rule says once you've communicated acceptance, you can't take it back. And the communication is dropping it in the mail, folks. It's out of your control. So what's communication on email? Press and send. It's communication on email. Same with the text message. What's communication with snail mail or paper mail? Dropping it in the mailbox. Dropping it in the mailbox. Any mailbox. It is a federal crime to take stamped mail out of a mailbox, even the one in front of your house. You put it in that box, isn't it? People don't realize that. Even the one in front of your house, it is not your property. What does it say stamped on that thing, Jamila? That pretty sure doesn't know. It says property of the Postmaster General. Even if you bought it at Lowe's and you paid your hard earned money for it and you put it in the ground, it says property of the Postmaster General. It's not yours. If you put a stamp on it and you put it in that box, it is a federal crime to take it out. You're not allowed. Hmm? Now, now, is anybody going to arrest you? Probably not. But that's the basis for the mailbox rule, that once it's out of your possession, you can't take it back. Does that make sense? Okay. So, what we say is, that communication happened the moment it was placed in transit, not whenever it gets received and read by whoever it's being sent to. And we still use the mailbox rule. This is why we still teach it. Very few people mail communication of acceptance in U.S. mail anymore. Right? We're mostly doing what? Email. But the mailbox rule still applies to email because as soon as we hit send, it's out of our possession. We can't take it back. It's communicated. It's under contract. Does it matter that somebody got it and read it on the other end? Back in the day, no. AOL had an unsend button. AOL did have an unsend button back in the day, but not anymore, I don't think. If you, you, see, if you use an AOL, stop, first of all. <laughs> I have an AOL. For what service is that? No, uh, oh, I know AOL. You could. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Outlook. 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 Outlook does, but how do they control once it's gone out of your server? I mean, they couldn't. Yeah. No if, it way. if it's not open, if it hasn't open, they can pull it back. Uh, about that. I've done it. <laughs> yeah, it worked. Yeah. But most of the times people are going to, their, their email to open them on that, you know, it's like right there. Front. Right. Okay, so they're opening it like instantly. instantly right. Yeah, so. Well, the mailbox rule says once you get sent, you can't take it back. So if you're communicating acceptance via email, when you click send, it's gone. Okay? So everybody got that? Yeah. All right. Make sure you understand the mailbox rule only applies, only applies. When you're communicating acceptance, you're going to get test questions on this. They're going to try to trip you up. The mailbox rule is one of those places where they try to trip you up. Because they'll say something like, going back to our example here, they'll say something like, Susie dropped the signed contract in the mail to Jeff. Uh -uh. And you're going to say, oh, that's the mailbox rule. As soon as she dropped it in the mail, it was communicated. But who was she communicating it to? To the same side. To herself. Yep. Right? 
Can we have communication? We said this with her mailing it to Jill. No. No, she'd have to be mailing it to somebody on the buyer side of the transaction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's not the mailbox rule unless you're actually communicating with the other side of the transaction. All right? And yes, electronic contracts are binding. Thank goodness. Take it from somebody who got their real estate license when they were not binding. That is a blessing. When I got my real estate license, you had to have six original copies of every contract. Who do you think those six were for? The Who's one? The buyer. The buyer. Who's the other one? The seller. The How about agent. us? The, the buyer agent, the listing agent. Who else? The attorney, the attorney and the, the firm is us. We already covered that one. I heard somebody say it. The bank, the lender. That was your six copies. Buyer, seller, listing agent or firm, selling agent or firm, right? Closing attorney, lender. Six copies. But back in the day, y'all had carbon copies. No. no. Not when I got in the business, we didn't. You printed out six copies of the thing. And they had the initial six copies. And they had to sign six copies. All right? Thankfully, now we recognize electronic signatures. An electronic signature is an electronic copy of a signature. So fax of a signature, it's a scan and email of a signature, it's a photocopy of a signature. So how many original signature documents do we have now? Well, not even really. Because you think about it, in this case, when Carlos fills out that offer from Quinn, what's the first thing he's probably going to do with it? He's going to scan it, right? Because he's going to send it to Jeff via what? Email. email. So now Jeff's got it. And he presents it to his client, Susie the seller. Is that an original signature he's presenting or is that an electronic signature he's presenting? It's electronic. And she signs and accepts it and then what's he going to do with it? Mm -hmm. He's going to scan it and email it back to Carlos. So how many original signatures does Carlos have on it? None. Is that okay? Yes. yes, thankfully. That is fine. And now we've moved into the world of digital signatures. Digital signatures, nobody ever signed a piece of paper in the first place. That's DocuSign. You just click. I agree. Click, 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 click. Click next, click next, click next, click next. Done. Love it. Best thing in the world that ever happened to real estate. Get rid of the paper. But all that's okay. Everybody good on communication and acceptance? Good. Okay. I would terminate offers. Another thing you're going to get a bunch of test questions about. The offer, he rejects the offer. They can just say, look, I, I'm not accepting your offer, we reject it. The offer expires after some time limit. Can we put a time limit on our offers? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, here's the kind of test question you might get. Or let me give you a fact first, and then I'll give you a test question. An offer can always, always, always be terminated prior to communication of acceptance. There is no conceivable way where you can say to the offer or no, your offer's locked in. They can always terminate their offer until we have communication of acceptance. Because after we have communication of acceptance, we're all we're under contract. Okay? So, that being said, I have submitted an offer and I put that my offer is valid until 5 p.m. on Thursday. Okay? That's an expiration, right? Uh -huh. My offer is going to expire 5 p.m. on Thursday. Can I call the listing agent on Wednesday at noon and say my offer is off the table? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Don't let an expiration talk you into the fact that the buyer is locked in for that amount of time. They can always terminate their offer whenever they want to prior to communication of acceptance. Okay? Withdrawal of an offer prior to acceptance would terminate it and death of either party. So if either party were to die during the offer process, that would terminate all offers. During the offer process. 
So, okay. You set an expiration on your own offer. Yep. Okay. And once that expires, it's dead. It's dead. If they don't do anything before then, it dies. And at that time. yet you can take it back. Sooner than that if I want to. Is so you common? hand me a piece of paper. Or, oh, it's an offer. Okay. I hand you an offer and I say, Hunter, this is good till Friday at 5 o'clock. Yeah. And Wednesday at noon, I, I call you back and I say, you know what? My offer's off the table. That's entirely fine. But if they were to communicate back and say, okay, we'll take it. Prior to me pulling it off the table. Signing it, then you're under contract. Prior to me pulling yeah. it off the table. Of yes. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. The reason you would put a time limit on your offer is some people just want a response within a certain amount of time. Some sellers are very unrealistic about response times. You know, I've had sellers that want to think over something two or three days. No, that is not reasonable. Yeah. That is not reasonable. I'm sorry if you've been in a seller situation in today's day and age. Three days to think over an offer is not a reasonable time frame. Okay? You know, and so you might, if you were on day two, I don't generally put expirations on my offers, but if I'm on day two and we haven't gotten a response, we might apply one at that time. We need to hear from you by five o'clock today or our offer's terminated. Move along. Let's go. So does that have to be in writing or? No. What do we say as far as communicating? Any method, right? So any method of communication, whether it's to communicate acceptance or just to communicate the offers, is an acceptable method of communication, right? So we can we can easily come back and verbally add an expiration to a written offer. We can take a written offer off the table verbally. Okay? Everybody good at that? Mm -hmm. All right. The other thing that we need to go over in this chapter, obviously, is the sales contract itself. Um, so let's take uh, a break, and then when we come back, we're going to actually go through um, the sales contract, and we're going to talk about some things that must be in there, and some things that can't be in there, and, and, and go through it. Okay.